Everyone knows the term cheating death. It's that moment when you dodge a bullet or miss a close call that could have ended your life or the loss of a loved one. But ultimately, for most people, you can't outrun mortality forever. Some individuals manage to cheat it for an impressive length of time, while others do not. I have cheated Mortis before, once, at least it hasn't caught up to me yet. Before it does, I feel an overwhelming need to have people know his story. Yes, you heard me right, his story, not mine. This narrative I'm about to go into isn't really about me, it's about a certain young man who will live a thousand lifetimes longer than I will. I know my time is short, my story will be done soon. His, however, risks being completely forgotten about and wasted away at. To keep his memory alive, I have taken it upon myself to tell everything he told me. As I mentioned, while I, along with a few select individuals, can temporarily cheat Mortis, there is always an underlying question. What happens if Mortis chooses to cheat you instead? What happens when, in the end, Mortis wins? In Northern Oregon, a young man named Evan, who was just 19, was diagnosed with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, a rapidly progressing blood cancer. He was given a short time to live, and his family was understandably devastated. He wished for weeks more, even months, just so he could spend time with his family. He hoped for a miracle. About a month later, Evan was on the verge of death. One night, he was going in and out of consciousness, trying hard to stay alive. It was looking like he was running out of steam, and he probably wasn't going to make it. It was at this crucial time that a mysterious figure entered his hospital room. He was wearing a black suit, fancy black dress shoes, a dark gray dress shirt with a white neckerchief, and a black fedora pulled down low over his eyes. He stood there for a moment, watching the young man struggle, a smile slowly appearing on his face. He walked up to Evan and stood beside the bed. What have we here? A voice, deep, raspy, cold, and unenthusiastic, came from the man's thin lips. The man sounded unimpressed, adding, Looks like your little issue is acting up again. Evan opened his eyes and looked up at the stranger standing over him. He whispered, Who are you? Originally, I came here with the intention of killing you. Sorry, I didn't mean to be so blunt. What I mean is, I'm a kind of savior, in a weird way. I came here to end the excruciating suffering you're going through. But after seeing you beg and plead so tirelessly, it seemed wrong not to answer your prayers, said the man, in a matter-of-fact tone. Every time he spoke, he seemed to be pulled back slightly, like his presence there was a terrible inconvenience. Evan, of course, was feeling quite bowled over. Who was this person and what did he want? And how could he have known Evan was locked in here from the inside? The more he thought about it, the less it made sense. I get it. So, what if I told you I could get you a significant extension on your life? Would you be interested? He said a touch of slyness and mischief in his voice. I know you want to get back to your family and I'm not being facetious, he said dryly, although his face didn't change. The man leaned forwards conspiratorially. What if I offered you the chance to keep living? Would you be willing to give me something of equal value in return? Not disproportionate, I promise. A fair trade. You can... save me? Seriously? Evan's eyes widened in disbelief, a thin shred of hope rekindling in his chest. The man saw Evan's eyes light up slightly at the idea and decided to press his luck. Leaning forward, he said in a pleasant voice, I'll give you your life, if you're willing to give me something much more valuable, your soul. Sign your soul away to me, and I can grant you this one wish you desire above all. Think of it as making a deal with the devil himself. Then added, But keep in mind, once you've signed, there's no turning back. This agreement is irrevocable. He watched Evan closely for his reaction. He snapped his fingers, and a white scroll, tied with a red ribbon, appeared and burst into flames. The man quickly grabbed the scroll and pulled it down, 
and it unfurled to reveal a detailed contract. A black feather floated next to the scroll, just as if it were stuck to an invisible surface. The young man leaned in to look at the handwriting, concerned, and then looked back up with a worried expression. You don't have much time left, so I would decide quickly. Your hourglass is down to its last grain of sand, the man told him, sounding bored. He asked if Evan could sign. Evan didn't trust him. There was something not right about him. But the fact was, if he didn't sign the paper now, he would die. With a heavy heart, weighed down by the seriousness of the moment and his own doubts, Evan picked up the pen. He was halfway through writing out half of his signature, the letters showing his uncertainty and tumult, when the man spoke again. Oh, I forgot to say, and this is important, by signing your soul away to me, you've also signed ownership of your body over. So, I own you, the man said, finishing the last signature. He made the pen disappear, and the paper vanished in a puff of blue smoke. Right in front of Evan, the whole room suddenly turned bright blue. He felt the room shake, which was incredible and terrifying. What the hell? What are you doing? The teenager had a sudden jolt of panic, going from having an invigorating morning to confused fear and instant regret. He saw the young adult now facing him, and black smoke that shouldn't have moved like a liquid yet wasn't quite solid either. It didn't look like it was getting near him, but it was black, and Evan seemed to be in agony. He heard him shouting for help, but he couldn't hear him properly due to the lump of the substance in his mouth, and the lad looked as if he had some in his eyes as well, as he tried to wipe them on his shirt. The man seemed to make an open-handed gesture with his finger towards Evan, and then he turned and walked away across the parking lot. During the activity, another paper landed and was slowly wafting to the ground beside Evan. He didn't notice or acknowledge it. The black substance now seemed to act as a blindfold, and just as the gas huffed to a stop and he grabbed the paper and got out of the car, it began to cover Evan's mouth and nose, cutting off his air supply. He needed something to read, and fast. Six months after he was let out of the hospital, Evan had a bad car accident. He was driving with his family through the middle of the city when they entered an intersection just as a driver ran a red light and hit their car on the passenger side. The force of the impact spun their car out and into a concrete support pillar for an elevated toll road. Evan's mother and father, who had been in the front seats, were killed. It had all happened so fast, the sudden and violent deaths of his parents and Evan having to deal with all of it, and the aftermath alone really affected him. A somber private funeral took place a few days later in his hometown where he grew up. During the ceremony for his parents, Evan noticed a man he recognized from somewhere among the attendees. Wondering if it could be the same person who had broken into his apartment, he went to speak with him. He motioned for the man to follow him, and they walked away from the small group of family members that had been his closest remaining relatives. Once they were out of earshot, the man revealed that he had a job for Evan to take care of. When Evan asked him for help, he said there was nothing he could do, that his parents' deaths had been necessary, and he walked away in annoyance. This upset Evan even more, who began to swear and yell at the man, asking how he could gain from killing innocent people. You'd probably be better off without them, the man said, his voice a little harsh, and the words hung in the air for a moment. The boy looked pissed and confused and even sadder than before. I knew there's no good way to break something like this to a kid, but the statement seemed to ring true, to me. The boy was surely considering it, so maybe it would do him some good. Wh what No. He fell to his knees and seemed to be on the verge of tears. I didn't know what to make of it. He was obviously not taking it well, and I felt a pang of guilt. My own heart was pounding as I tried to understand what I was seeing. You should be thanking me, he snapped, raising his head to meet supervisor's gaze. This will make your next job a whole lot easier. Keep in mind, kid, I'm only trying to help your sorry ass. In his tone, there was an unmistakable mix of arrogance and bizarre mentorship, as though he thought his actions were entirely for my benefit. Before he could go on, the guy just told him what happened in a way that sounded sincere. I have a job for you, boy, the man said, 
his voice dropping an octave to indicate that he was about to drop some serious dad wisdom on me. What kind of job? One you don't want to do yourself? Heh. To some degree, I need you to take on some permanent assignments, because I am so busy, and I am immortal, and I own your soul. I am Mortis, death itself. You can't back out of this agreement. There's no way to quit. You'll never be able to leave me. Oh, really? Evan asked, raising his eyebrows. No, it is, I said. And your job would be in the SHADE department that stands for Ghastly Reaping Archangel of Ethnologies. It's grand-sounding, but it basically means you deal with culture and knowledge. Oh, S-H-I-T? Evan tries spelling back, frowning and concentrating. He is a bit embarrassed to have misspelled it on the first try. No, you dummy! It's pronounced like the color gray! His face looked frustrated, like I was being dumb and making him work harder than he had to. So if you wanted, we could call you a Grim Reaper. Actually, no, I don't like that term. It's overused and not scary or intimidating anymore. Too many people romanticize the idea of it. Either way, your job is going to be to collect souls from people who are about to die. Whether they are strangers or friends, good or bad, men or women, young or old. Your feelings for them, whatever they would be, won't matter. You won't get to know anyone well enough for them to matter to you. You won't know any of them at all, really. Each person gets a certain amount of time until you have to collect their soul. If you don't, they can get a stay of execution, so to speak, for a day or two, until you come back. The man in the skeleton mask explained, getting testy from answering so many questions from the young man. As bad as it sounds, why can't they just die instead of getting an extension, I thought. I found the situation strange and morbid. No. There's got to be a reason those two died. You can't just play fast and loose with snatching dead people up. We're not incompetent fucking lunatics like those morons who strangle people with piano wire or the jackasses who are responsible for so many missing person cases. If we were, we'd all be out of a job. People would be running around in terror, thinking we had a serial killer loose. He shook his head. Not that we don't. Hence Jack the Ripper's unfortunate removal. No, we definitely hold ourselves to a higher standard than that. We're professionals. He summoned a pocket watch and held it aloft, setting it on both hands and turning it from silver to blue. The symbol of a grim reaper. You gonna pawn it? Evan said dryly, not really laughing. This here pocket watch, Mortis started, holding it gingerly between his bony fingers, is more than it appears. It is a lifeline to a person's soul. When the hand moves and begins to rush around the face, it starts a timer, so to speak. From that moment until the hand completes a full circuit, it is your job to collect the soul for whom the watch is set. If the hand completes a full circuit, the watch's flame will go out, indicating that person is marked for unexpected death and their time extends. I must reiterate, this is not a good thing, having your assigned souls go around. We can't just go handing out bonus days to anyone who happens to be walking around. How the hell am I supposed to know who I need to kill? How the hell would I even begin to find them? I said, frustrated again. It was making less and less sense. Don't worry about it, Mortis said with a smile and a wave. You'll know where to find them. Trust your instincts, John. They'll bring you right to the person you mean to find. And when you do, you'll recognize them before you even see them. He paused smirking slightly, though he actually looked human for a moment, and I was reminded his name was Mortis. Your shift starts at six tonight, he said, turning to walk away. His cloak billowed behind him, blending in with the shadows that constantly clung to him. I'll be watching to see how you handle this. Should be... interesting. He chuckled lightly as he disappeared into the night. After Mortis left, Evan felt his legs go weak, and he sat down on the ground. There was just too much to take in, and it was impossible to make a plan in the face of so many unknowns with no warning. After a few minutes, Evan snapped out of his funk and started trudging home. It was a long walk back. He entered his house and lay down on the couch, covering his face with his arms. He was alone, 
and it wasn't long before he fell asleep and drifted into an uneasy series of dreams filled with questions and hopes. The sun had gone down, and it was evening time. Inside, someone who was attempting to sleep on the sofa was tossing and turning. They could hear heavy footsteps coming down the hallway moving quickly and directly towards the couch. Wake up, stupid. It's time. I opened my eyes and it was still mostly dark outside. Evan sat straight up in bed and looked around in the dark. Who's there? He called, his voice echoing slightly. There was nothing there but an empty house, no furniture or people, and yet, he thought he might not be alone. As he walked quietly through the house, he thought he heard voices and footsteps. It was creepy, but he couldn't explain it. Suddenly, someone grabbed Evan from behind by the hair and pulled him backward. He reached up and grabbed the person's arm, trying to pull away but was unable to. The person had something sharp and cold pressed up against his throat. A knife? He didn't know. He needed to think fast. Stop squirming, you little fuck. You're not making this any easier. The voice sighed impatiently above him. Evan opened his eyes and saw Mortis standing over him, pressing his head against the back of the couch. It was fascinating to see him like this. He felt the cold hand on the back of his head and decided against trying to pull away. You! What the hell are you- Tonight's your first night of reaping. I'm going to make sure I'm there myself, so you don't fuck up. This is a big deal, and a lot of first-timers get overwhelmed. It's my job to make sure you don't make any mistakes and have a smooth first experience. In that second, Mortis snapped his fingers. Evan looked around, confused and a little concerned. His eyes went wide and he started rubbing them, then blinked a few times before staring at his fingers. He realized they were covered in black goo and started coughing and choking violently until he spat out a few horrible black blobs, choking and gasping for air, realizing with dawning horror. What did you do? This, this is the stuff from earlier, isn't it? Evan muttered, his eyes widening as he stumbled upon the realization. But before he could say anything more or ask another question, Mortis, moving faster than I thought possible, yanked his head back and stuck his hands into Evan's eyes. Now, now, don't move around. It will only make it worse, he warned. The teenager, overcome with panic, screamed loudly. The man, single-minded, began digging with his fingers into the eye sockets and at one point yanked upwards so hard on Evan's head after having removed his right eye that his hand slipped away and he had to reposition his fingers. He pulled Evan's eye out then, and blood drained from his eyes and mouth, feeling like acid on his skin as it ran down his cheeks. In those agonizing minutes, Evan watched an impossibly morbid scene play out in front of him. It's just a precaution. Don't worry so much. You're not going to die. I won't allow it. Mortis seemed uneasy, but still had his typical laid-back demeanor. He didn't enjoy this, of course, but he saw it as necessary or even routine. Mortis tossed Evan's right eyeball to the ground with a casual flick of his wrist. He paused, watching Evan try and fail to respond, then continued with his work, carefully using the knife to cut two lines across Evan's left eye. Evan struggled and tried to escape, thinking quickly and considering his options. He knew he wouldn't be able to overpower Mortis. Mortis let go of Evan and watched him as he fell to the floor and curled up in a ball. Evan held his face and moaned, then put his hands back to his mouth. Mortis took out his knife and held it up to Evan's throat. He pushed enough that Evan's jaw would open, and Mortis held his mouth shut with shaking, thin fingers. He put the knife into his mouth and made a couple of rough, shallow cuts to Evan's tongue. Mortis didn't cut it off completely, but it was badly damaged and would take a long while to heal. He also made several shallow cuts around Evan's mouth, including his lips and gums. Just then, Evan was suddenly very focused on not being able to turn around, and was instead busy choking on his blood and the weird black stuff coming out of his eyes and mouth. Not a pretty sight, but it was easy to see the dark patches against the white carpet. Mortis didn't seem to mind, and stood up, allowing Evan to roll over onto his stomach. At least it was a more comfortable position 
although he was still coughing up a lot of blood and black goo for Mortis's benefit. Mortis went and sat down on the couch, watching Evan with mild interest as he thrashed and struggled. Evan was in a lot of pain, and it was only getting worse. His vision was fading fast, just like his ability to speak. In a strange way, he was feeling worse all over, more sore, and his throat was killing him. He moaned and muttered and yelped, but there was nothing really he could do, except brace himself for the next surge of pain. He seemed like he was just trying to get by, I guessed. What kind of precaution is that, though? Why would he get put through all that just to be told he was going to get to live a real life? He felt like Mortis had pulled a fast one on him, taking away his hope of getting out of this hell. Each question that ran through his head felt like a hammer to the chest he couldn't understand. Evan deliberately refocused, pulling himself out of his head. In the moment he remembered he wasn't alone. He could feel the other person looking at him. He shook his head, letting this register. That's not personal. You should be glad that you'll eventually heal, Mortis said, then seemed to stop for a moment before continuing, speaking again after it had gathered its thoughts. I had to do this. Given your current condition, where you cannot see faces of your targets, you would not be able to show mercy. You won't even be able to show mercy to those you knew when you were a child, when you first joined the Force and are sent on calls as a rookie. It's a basic human instinct to be biased towards people you recognize. It's ingrained in our nature. That's precisely why, when we first met, I made you swallow some blight. You know, the stuff you can't stop puking out. It's working its way to your brain. It will help you be objective when it's time to do your job. It's a crude but effective method. Once you get well, you should be able to make the right decisions without any issues. Evan stammered and mumbled, his words just about unintelligible as he tried to speak. It was like he had a halting, delayed secret and was trying to catch up, but was having trouble speaking. He sounded frustrated. Why did I blind you and cut out your tongue, you ask me? Well, in order to do this job, you have to have no emotions and no personal investment. You can still carry the mental capability to have these emotions, just not the physical capability of displaying them with your face. I've just removed this capability, along with one other minor exception. You no longer have the muscles to display emotion, except via body language. Otherwise, you would not be able to do your job, Mortis explained, clearly proud of the logical sense of his explanation. A small smirk played at the corners of his mouth as he chuckled. He quickly, but very carefully, bandaged Evan's eyes and mouth to stop the bleeding and to continue his symbolism lesson. Then he turned back to Evan and, still trying to suppress a grin, said, less jovially, Okay, now that that's taken care of, let's get back to work for the night. He left, not saying anything else, and disappeared. The patient looked around feeling sorry for himself and uncomfortable, and then threw up thickly from the taste of iron in his mouth. He struggled and tried to open his left eye and got a general impression of red and black, bandages hastily tied around his head, preventing him from seeing properly. He discovered he felt lightheaded and dizzy. Evan got the strong urge to stand up, and so he did, unsteadily, hoisting one arm up and opening his fist to reveal an antique-looking pocket watch with blue flame hands, Despite the fact that he couldn't physically see blue flames, he was absolutely sure that's what he was seeing. He legit felt like the watch was telling him where to go. He knew that's where he was supposed to go to kill someone. It seemed like he had plenty of time to get there while he watched it, as it didn't seem to be moving much. He heard a soft noise beside him, like clothes dragging across the ground, and looked down at his hand, which was filled with garments. He quickly sorted through and found mostly clothing articles, as well as one pair of shoes and a pair of gloves at the bottom. The clothes looked perfectly normal, and the watch in his hand looked anything but. He was struck with a strong sense of purpose and mystery as he dumped out the clothes and prepared to move on. It only took a few minutes for Evan to change into an outfit that matched Mortis's distinctive style. A long, dark blue, heavily frayed hooded trench coat, a gray button-up shirt with a striped vest now containing his old watch, a red tie, dark trousers with gloves, and black and white dress shoes. 
He looked like a mobster, complete with bloody bangs and bandages peeking out from under his clothes. After he had finished dressing, Evan took out the watch and looked at it, shaking his head. Despite being nearly blind and dizzy, he managed to get dressed quickly and efficiently. Evan headed off to where he was going with purpose. He left his house and started to run, not just quickly, but inhumanly fast, as if he were a ghost gliding over the ground. He checked his watch often while he ran, not to tell the time but to gauge something else. The closer he got to his destination, the more he felt like he was catching fire, which was a good thing. About 50 minutes into his journey, he found an older apartment building on the route with some old world charm, and after checking his watch, leaped up to the second floor, landing quietly on the metal fire escape. He had never jumped that high before, but wasn't about to question it. He pressed his face against the window, listening intently for talking or movement inside, and wasn't too surprised to hear the man with the cigar cough and come into view from around the corner. The man was smoking a cigar and seemed engrossed in thought until he looked up and saw the woman with the toddler. A silent shadow figure in a long coat and wide-brimmed hat was watching his apartment. What the hell are you doing? Get the fuck out of here before I come out there and get you myself, you little bastard, the man yelled, though he didn't sound quite so angry, more shaken and upset than anything else. There was a sense of urgency there that made it seem like he was serious. It wasn't just a throwaway command given in the heat of the moment. There would be trouble if the boy didn't listen. Evan was gagged, and his cheek was swollen so he couldn't speak. He just looked down and shook his head, then looked at the man in front of him. It was him, all right. The very person Evan was supposed to kill. Hey, I said get the fuck out of here, the man called, walking quickly and angrily over to Evan. Before the guy could react, Evan, driven by instinct and without a single clear thought in his mind, ran inside. The force of his entry shattered the window into countless small shards upon impact. I heard someone stomping around upstairs. Hey, quiet up there. People are trying to sleep, I shouted, exasperated, my voice showing my annoyance and impatience. Both the guy and Evan ignored the complaint. You bastard, the man yelled, charging at the kitchen to grab his gun. Evan was faster, though, and managed to catch him before he did. He didn't want to have to do it, but he was used to dealing with confrontations. He grabbed the man and turned him around, quickly pushing him as hard as he could against the wall, creating a large crater in the drywall. He felt an electric burst of adrenaline and power, despite himself. He always tried to avoid resorting to violence, but it never felt completely wrong when he did. On an emotional level, at least. There was a small part of him that always secretly enjoyed it. I mean, look at this piece of shit. The man got up, shook his head, and tried to blink the stars out of his vision. Who the hell do you think... You... The man stammered, making brief eye contact at the bloodied, bandaged face looking back at him. He suddenly seems to realize he had not fully taken in the injured man's appearance and was immediately turned off by what he saw. His expression changed, and he turned, running out the door and down his stairs. Evan did not chase him, and just checked his watch idly. He had lots of time to get to where he was going. Besides, he didn't even want to do what he was planning on doing. While the jerk he would be confronting was a bad boss, and obviously a bit of a jerk, it didn't seem right to Evan. Evan walked over to the broken window and looked outside. He saw the man stumble out into the open, coughing and gagging. He felt sorry for him, but figured he had no choice. There was something about it he felt he needed to do. He pushed the thought out of his mind and decided he must be going mad or something. He shook his head and felt angry, for some reason, at Mortis. His hands began shaking. He felt determined and a bit sick, and he jumped out the broken window, landing a few yards ahead of the fleeing man. What do you want from me? The man shouted, his voice panicked and confused, loud enough to attract the attention of his neighbors. He took a few steps back, realizing what was going on. He seemed to panic, and then evidently decided to take control of the situation by lunging at Evan, attempting to catch him by surprise. 
Evan, however, was too quick and nimble and managed to dodge the man's desperate attack. They weren't even close. They began a sort of macabre game of chase with the man as it and Evan as the elusive target. Evan seemed to play with his victim, as if he were unsure if he wanted it to be over quickly or not. He appeared totally torn, like he wanted to get it over with as well as save the man's life. Evan took another punch he couldn't avoid to the left side of his face and felt the jolt of pain. He stumbled slightly, and the man quickly swung back and hit him in the right temple, causing him to fall to his knees. The man laughed, amused at the freaky, pathetic excuse for an opponent he had in the transfer POW. This further attack made Evan clench his fists tighter, shaking off the tremor that had started from the top of his shoulders, getting worse that time and becoming more and more noticeable. The man's laughter caught in his throat and faltered. The man could see the change in Evan, the glowing red, the obvious rage as the blight guaranteed a reversal of the odds in the uneven fight. What? The hell? The man exclaimed, his voice shaking and he stepped backwards a couple of steps. The light in the hallway began to grow darker to Evan. His adversary didn't move, just knelt on the ground, head hanging in apparent silence. Evan felt a sudden chill, as if tiny insect feet were walking over his skin. Looking down, he saw a mass of cockroaches, centipedes, beetles, moths, and other insects surrounding him like a carpet moths fluttering around and landing on him. He tried to stamp on them and brush them off, but they seemed unaffected. For every bug he killed, it seemed like two replaced it. Ha <laughs> ha The man heard someone laugh and looked up. He saw Evan's shadow on the ground approaching and getting longer. When it reached him and touched his feet, the blight began to pool around him. He stepped out of the way, but it stuck to his boots like a piece of gum in mud. It was unexpected and unpleasant, reminding him where he was. Ha ha ha, ha 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 ha, ha 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 ha, ha 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 ha. I had no idea what was so funny. The bandaged man was laughing madly and had now started to bleed through the bandages. The blood began to soak into the white cloth. I felt a sinking in my stomach. I hated the thought of him escaping. All my concern for his mental state evaporated. Obviously, he was criminally insane. What was the point of running, of trying to get away from the bugs and the cobwebs and the increasing darkness? All I was doing was delaying the inevitable. I had no idea why someone would want to laugh like that, but I knew that I needed to get away. I knew that much, at least. I turned to run. Evan put his head in his hands, stood up, and looked at his hands, then ran his finger over his palm and saw it was bloody. He looked at his mouth and saw it was bleeding then stopped when he realized his eyes had started bleeding as well from not having time to heal and became more weepy and bloodshot. He seemed to get even more mad, his arms and hands shaking even more. There was a moment where he grabbed his mouth and gently touched his bandages, only enough to loosen them a bit. It seemed like he was having a hard time dealing with not just the physical pain he was in, but his mental state as well. What the hell is wrong with you, freak? The man was completely mystified. His voice was high and thin, even more so than it had been when he had been talking about bugs crawling on his skin, and all of that seemed to drain out of his mind as he watched Evan's actions. The scene seemed to unfold slowly in front of him. Each moment seemed to take extra time, as if filled with fear and confusion, until both emotions combined to form an overwhelming feeling in his chest. As soon as the man spoke, Evan stopped laughing and took his hands away from his face. He grimaced. His entire face was covered in vibrant teal and black veins. The bandages on his left eye shifted and revealed a glowing, raging red. The man turned and ran in pure terror. Evan watched him go. His state was so angry that I could see it. I could feel it. He was shaking with rage and looking at me, gritting his teeth and striding slowly and deliberately toward his target. It wasn't long before the man picked up the pace, glancing over his shoulder to see Evan gaining on him. He was puzzled. The guy had been walking. How was he gaining ground so quickly? This spurred the man to run faster, despite the burning in his lungs and the stitch in his side. It seemed impossible, but it was true. Evan was catching up.
the world went dark, and he suddenly felt something grab his leg, causing him to fall. He rolled over, and his heart raced in terror when he saw what looked like a ghost in front of him, shimmering and glowing a dull teal light that was barely visible. It looked horrible, with wide red eyes and skeletal arms covered in decayed flesh. It had no legs, instead its lower body seemed to dissolve into a mass of tattered cloth-like tendrils, and it was crawling and wheezing for air while it reached out to him. He whipped his head around, stopping his struggles in shock and horror at what he saw. There were more of them now. Dozens of them surrounded him. He let out an involuntary shriek of fear, the pure terror running through him, causing him to yell louder and more stridently than he imagined he ever had in his whole life. Let, let me, let me alone, the man screamed. The poltergeists surrounded him, while mosquitoes landed on his skin, adding to the discomfort. They were biting, and he could feel every leg as they walked across his skin. He didn't want to look, but he did, and blinked his eyes closed once before reopening them. As his eyes came back into focus, he saw a figure walking toward him. Stay back, stay the fuck back, he said, sounding scared and defiant. I could see him holding a small knife, although he was trying to sound threatening. The man chuckled softly at seeing the dark figure. Immediately after dropping down and flew straight at the middle-aged man. The man, in response, jumped to his feet and began pushing his way through the ghosts around him, moving as fast as he could to get away. Just in time, he made it out of the way of a large curved blade with a chain attached to it, which she had thrown at him. It landed with a thud, a meter in front of where he had been standing. He panted hard with fear and exertion, relieved he had managed to get away. Evan laughed, maybe a little too hard. He smiled and summoned the souls, wanting to mess with and tease the man. He was having fun and enjoyed himself, not knowing his harmless prank was reaching a somewhat malevolent conclusion. He didn't appear to be thinking harsh thoughts, but then, who would? Evan held out his hand to the side and muttered under his breath. Illusionary smoke swirled around his forearm, coalescing into a staff shape and lengthening, before he finally finished casting. A curved blade grew, and a chain appeared, connecting it to the smoky encasement around his arm, so that when it cleared away, there was a solid staff-like weapon in his hand. It was as tall as he was. He looked at it in wonder, and felt he somehow knew how to do this summoning. He knew what kind of weapon it was actually supposed to be, a scythe. The ancient symbol of reaping but for Evan, it was just a scythe, and it was perfect for him. He was relieved and excited to have discovered it. Evan chased after the guy and cut him off, getting in his face. The man looked down, and then up at the single red eye looking at him, then back at Evan's face, as he pressed his palm against the guy's jawline and neck. In an instant, the man's face looked as though it was melting away his muscles wasting, his stomach receding, his eyes receding into his skull and his skin looking decayed, his bone structure poking through his rotting flesh. The guy deflected Evan's hand, stumbling away, panting, appearing to be exhausted. There was plausibly cause for that, but no sooner had he retreated from Evan Hardy's proximity than his own body began to look normal again, within seconds, with no injury. In that split second, things once again looked normal, and he was standing in the middle of the empty street. A car horn blared, and a vehicle came speeding down the road. The car was moving way too fast, and there was no time to warn the man before it careened directly into him, colliding at high speed. He was sent flying up into the air and fell to the street with a huge impact, tumbling across the pavement and having most of his body scraped along it. He was obviously very badly injured. But as the car drove away, and he lay there writhing and groaning, he seemed to be still alive. The pieces of the puzzle came together in my head, and I realized that Evan must have been planning on finishing the job himself. The lights flicked on in the apartment complex, and people started heading out into the street. Evan knew he only had a few moments before someone saw him. He walked over to the body whose face was squashed and broken definitely going to be high on the list of worst faces Evan had seen. The man had what looked like crushed ribs, and one leg was bent back the wrong way. 
he looked in pretty bad shape and not much like a coherent threat at the moment. Evan got his scythe ready and the sounds of a waking neighborhood filled his ears. People were coming out and discussing what was going on. He could hear sirens in the distance. The man on the ground was taking slow breaths. He took a deep breath, preparing himself for what was next. Huh, why? The man was struggling to talk, his voice was barely above a whisper, and he was slowly dying. He wanted to know before he died, I guess. It's just business, Evan managed to say in a muffled voice, clearly signaling from the audible difficulty in speaking that he had sustained some injuries. All right. Evan took a deep breath, gripping his scythe with both hands, and then quickly brought it down through the man's chest, directly over his heart. As his scythe made contact, a spray of red blood sprayed out, covering the man, and Evan visibly shook from the action. His eyes widened and flicked through a variety of emotions, before finally settling on fear and concern. This was the first time Evan had killed someone, and he found it exhilarating. He hated himself for it, but there was no denying it. He found he liked being a killer, hated the fact that's what he had become, but knew it was time to just accept it as his new lot in life. And really, a small part of him was relieved to finally have an excuse to lash out at others. He knew it made him a bad person, but he couldn't help but feel secretly overjoyed. A bright orb appeared just over his heart and floated up out of his chest. Not possible. It was the man's soul. Evan held his hand out and the orb floated into it. He felt its energy, closed his hand around it, crushed it, and it disappeared. What's going on over there? Evan turned around to see a group of people come out of the alley onto the street and start walking towards him. He quickly glanced back at the body on the ground, and upon seeing what he saw, backtracked his thought. The big, gaping wound that had been on the man's chest seconds ago was completely gone. There was still blood, but the man had obviously been killed by the car, not foul play. That was certainly one way to frame someone for murder, Evan thought to himself. A peculiar return. He was definitely curious what had really happened here. Evan ran down the street and turned into an alley before leaping up and climbing the fire escapes to the roof. He knelt on the ledge and looked down at the street, cupping his hands to his mouth and heard a collective gasp as people in the crowd noticed the dead man. Sirens blared and then people in the crowd started to scream and swear. Someone called for an ambulance and police, despite the fact that two police cars were already pulling up from the other direction for the noise complaints. It didn't look like anything could be done for the man, though. Evan, who had been concentrating intently, suddenly heard someone walking up behind him. He turned, alarmed, and tried to see who, what it was. Well done, the figure said, clapping. I expected nothing less of you. There was a tone of sincerity in his voice. When the figure stepped into the light, it turned out to be Mortis himself. He was wearing his usual getup and looked out at the crowd without saying anything. Oh good, it looks like you've gone ahead and made a mess, he said, shaking his head. You weren't really supposed to make a scene, though. As he spoke, he turned his cane around in his hands, rebuking me for not controlling myself better. Well, at least you got your job done. Not bad for your first time, he said, conceding his earlier point as he took his time finishing his loop behind the handball court. Looks like you enjoyed yourself, though. Maybe a little too much. Evan flinched at the last sentence he heard. He wanted to reply, but his face wasn't yet healed enough to talk. I know you want to talk right now, to tell me what you think, but I really don't feel like listening to your muffled voice right now, Mortis had said, looking over at Evan. There was a brief examination, then he chuckled dryly. Yeah, I can see the anger in your eyes. I felt the same way when I was first put in charge. Trust me, you're not the only one. There are lots of people in the same boat here. Mortis turned to face me, flames igniting around him, turning a deep blue. Just try to remember, Shade. You're not the only person who's been through that trial. It just takes time. He glanced at me speculatively before adding my name. The flames surrounding him seemed to flicker in almost sympathetic acknowledgement. 
It's Evan, Evan said. His tone made it clear that I had mispronounced his name, and not only that, I should have known better. Nope, the man replied, grinning at Evan. He was clearly getting a kick out of this. Oh, you should get your next assignment soon. Have fun with that. Oh, and, uh, don't overdo it. He emphasized the last few words, giving Evan a look that made him think it might possibly be a warning. Evan turned back to the crowd, looking at the paramedics as they loaded the man into the ambulance. He sighed and shook his head, deep in thought. What had he become? He had just been feeling good a moment ago. What had all those new... abilities been about? They felt strange and wrong somehow. The more he thought about it, however, the more concerned he became. He didn't like this new situation or the new name as much as it felt like an anchor around his neck. He didn't feel like there was much he could do about it, however, besides just doing his job. That's all he knew was being the S-H-A-D-E, the Grim Reaper, taking the souls of people at the moment of death. It gave him a cold chill. As Evan gained more experience in his field, he took his job more and more seriously. He checked for new deaths and accidents in the news every day. Most of the deaths he found were listed as brain trauma or heart attacks, and some of them were just obvious like car accidents, diseases, or injuries. Sometimes, however, there were unexpected similarities between incidents, such as every victim having a particular hairstyle or wearing a particular article of clothing. Although the people working these cases couldn't find the cause of death, the bodies all had a weird, unexplained line of blood splatter across the heart area, chest forensically, that someone had overlooked. So could it be a murder? Could even be a serial killer, some said. You never know, laughed others. Old age, suggested a few. People died. Who cares? What really mattered was there appeared to be no external marks causing the blood splatter, which was confusing and made it hard to guess what the circumstances could possibly be. Was it an accident? Was it a murder? Etc. Well, none of them are wrong. It is technically the work of a serial killer, and it could be argued that it is the work of a god as well. Many people have said that Satan breathed the life into the killer and let him run free, but it's not. It's actually the Grim Reaper doing his job, and it explains the weird deaths that have always baffled people. Once the public started to catch on to this, there were rumors of people encountering him and surviving. With the advent of the internet, these stories spread like wildfire and even became something of a cultural phenomenon. People claim to have met the Grim Reaper and lived. There is also me, I guess, who not only saw but met and barely escaped the Grim Reaper or as he called himself, S-H-A-D-E. But I don't know, I always called him Evan. That's his actual name and the only link he has to his past. He has a lot of trouble remembering things, especially his life before Mortis. Recently, he seems to have been having trouble remembering the incident at all. I thought that if I called him Evan, it might jog loose some memories. I feel so sorry for him, being stuck in this situation and never even having asked for it, never mind having deserved it. I know there are thousands who would argue my sympathy is misplaced, given his past actions. But I feel empathetic towards almost everybody I meet. I mean, it's not always a virtue, but then again, who would claim perfection for themselves? It's clear from this self-reflection that empathy has always been one of my strongest qualities, one of my greatest weaknesses. I guess I can't help it. It always has been. I'm waiting for my next meeting with him. I know for a fact he's going to come back for me and take my soul this time. I won't be getting out. Very funny, all things considered. I remember about the last four years pretty clearly. For some reason, just before he left, he turned to me and asked, You know, something has been on my mind. I'm just curious. I mean seriously. If you were about to die right now, what would your last words be? After thinking about it, and figuring I might never get the chance to do it if I didn't, I was just so curious about who he really was. I mean, what was this guy's deal? I don't know, but... What happened to you? Or what did you do to end up like this? The person questioned, 
sounding genuinely perplexed. I looked into his good eye. It was sad, not bored or angry. He told me pretty much everything he knew, speaking quietly and with some reluctance, as if he didn't think it was a good idea to tell anyone these things. I am in a unique position in that I'm essentially the only person he ever confided in, and it looks like I will be for a while. This is why I've taken it upon myself to tell his story to you here. My intention is to tell you who Shade, the Reaper, or whatever you choose to call him, really is. It's important to understand that he wasn't always a bad guy. I know for a fact that at one time he was a good being, not given over to dark impulses. Important to remember that he likely doesn't have the same options open to him now that he used to have. It is not a path he chose, and his story should be seen in that light. It is pretty funny, actually. When I first saw him, I remember he had these piercing red eyes, dark veins all over his body and face, blood in his hair and really pale skin. But the thing that really sticks out in my memory is something he said. He turned to me and said something before he was going to kill me. It's just business. 